that we are recording. There it is. All right, good, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to today's first session, the long-awaited disaster risk reduction series. Those that may not know, this session was supposed to start at the beginning of uh, 2020, I believe. That was even before I had joined Few Social, but the joys of the pandemic pushed it back just a little bit, but that's okay, we're here now. So my name is Kayla Dick. I am the Strategic Learning Co Coordinator for Fuse Social. I will be your host moderator this morning. So if you have any questions, you can direct them my way. So before we get going, I just want to make sure to um, allow everyone to understand the functions of this Zoom today. It might be a little different than what you're used to. So this is a webinar Zoom. So if you're sitting in the audience wondering why I can't see myself, um, see it as a good thing. You can keep your camera off. You can refill your coffee. You can go for a bathroom break if you need it. We don't see you. So um, so just the panelists today are the only ones that will be seen. If you have any questions, concerns, anything, you can either use the chat function. You hovered um, down towards the bottom of your screen on Zoom. You can either use chat or there is a question and answer function. So if you have a question for our, our guest speaker, um, Professor David Alexander today, you can put your question there. I will do my best at the end of the session to make sure that your question is answered. So I have a few people on my screen here that I need to introduce to you. But before I go ahead and do that, I just want to acknowledge um, that those of us that are in Wood Buffalo, this meeting is being held on Treaty 8 lands, which is the traditional territory of the Korean and Dine people and the unceded territory of the Métis people. Their footsteps were the first to walk here and um, they call this home. And I acknowledge that they have welcomed and shared this land for us to call home as well. So in order for us to get started, I'm going to pass it over to Chantelle Beaver, who is our executive director here at Fuse Social to welcome everybody today. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are all well and dry. I'm not sure where everyone is, but here in Wood Buffalo, we have a rainy, dreary morning. So it's actually okay to be working in at home today. I'm feeling okay about that. Um, my name is Chantal, as Kayla said, I am the executive director at Fuse Social in Fort McMurray with Buffalo. We reside on Treaty 8 land and are very proud to share that land. Uh, Fuse Social is a proud partner with the Canadian Red Cross in many ways, um, especially today as we kick off this disaster risk reduction speaker series. This series is aimed at promoting and building awareness of disaster risk reduction or DRR. Um, those of us who knew Mr. Guy Shuke will hear him speak a bit often. And, and we'll, we're looking to bring our local social profit sector together and to leverage our collective knowledge and experiences to work towards a blueprint to disaster risk and loss for a safer, more sustainable future in the Wood Buffalo region. This speaker series will feature one session per month over the next seven months, with each session highlighting a new amazing speaker and topic. Just as Fuse Social does in its everyday work, this initiative recognizes the value of the social profit sector, and it seeks to help promote the essential role of our social profit sector. On behalf of Fuse Social, I would like to sincerely thank the Canadian Red Cross for empowering us as partners in this work. And I would like to welcome each and every one of you here today. I hope to see you back over the next seven months as we work together to shift the way we think and act when it comes to the problem of disaster. Over to you. Thank you, Chantal. Perfectly said. So next up, I'm going to um, introduce Laura. She is from the TRI, the Resilience Institute, and I will let her tell you all about an exciting initiative that we have joined in with this disaster risk series. Thanks so much. Um, I'm here coming to you from Canmore, which is Treaty 7 territory and home of Métis um, number three. We um, we're also just outside of Banff National Park and we have a sprinkle of snow on the mountains this morning. So it's quite spectacular. We're working on um, doing a pilot um, that is alongside of this initiative called Fire and Ice. And it's gonna be a small cohort of social profits. We're still defining who those are gonna be. And this lucky cohort is going to get to learn about the, well, glaciers, but it, ice in the context of what matters up there. And one of those key features is ice jams. And then fire from different perspectives. So not the same old perspectives, different perspectives. Um, that was also a bit of a surprise. 
And then we learn some skills with writing and photography. We bring it all together in a way to talk about disasters differently. So it's bringing together some really scary stuff um, with art and opening up the space for dialogue in a different way. We've done this before. It was really successful. I'm looking forward to another successful and unique way of doing this in the Wood Buffalo region, which I, I just love. Um, and I'm so happy to be working on this with you all. So I'll leave it at that. And if anybody has any questions about the Resilience Institute or this project, do feel free to reach out to us. Um, of course, you can always just connect with Kayla or you can also, Kyla, sorry, I do it every time I read your name. Um, you could reach out to her or you could just look us up at resilienceinstitute.ca. So thank you and I'll pass it back. Thanks, Laura. I'm so jealous. Um, I, I miss the mountains. I miss the skiff of snow on the mountains. Like nothing, nothing's better than that. I'm a central Alberta girl from heart. So I miss the mountains. So I'm a little jealous. <laughs> um, thank you so much. So yeah, like Laura said, if you have any questions on that, um, you can either reach out to me or Laura directly. Um, and lastly, before we get to the main event here, I will pass it on to Jen McManus uh, with the Red Cross. And just one quick reminder for those that have just joined. Um, if you do have any questions for any of us here um, or for Professor Dave Alexander, please remember to just leave your questions in the Q&A section and we will do our best to get to them at the end. On that note, off to you, Jen. Hi, hi everybody. Well, I get to come to you all. I'm the Vice President of the Caney Red Cross here in Alberta and Northwest Territories. So I get to lead a fantastic team of community partners and Red Cross volunteers and staff from Tuk 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 Northwest Territories all the way to Coots, Alberta. And I can tell you that we've got people working right through that whole longitude uh, right now for COVID-19, the pandemic, and also risk reduction work. I am coming to you from the confluence of the Bow and the Elbow Rivers in Treaty 7 territory, uh, Confederacy of the Blackfoot, uh, our sisters and brothers of the Sutina First Nation, as well as Stony Nakoda. And of course, our Métis sisters and brothers, and I'm proud to be a settler, living, working, recreating, and leading from Treaty 7. Uh, really a privilege and uh, to be able to kick off this speaker series. This is unique for us in Canada. There are many parts of the world that are already thinking in um, the framework of disaster risk reduction. And uh, we, because of the generosity of Canadians after the wildfire of 2016, we are able to do uh, more innovative and, and thought-provoking uh, collaboration work with the generosity and the gifts that we received from uh, donors, corporate partners, and from government. So on behalf of Conrad Sauvé, the Canadian Red Cross, I welcome all of you. And I thought I would just quickly give a couple of highlights on what disaster risk reduction is and what it is not. And then I get to introduce um, our guest speaker, uh, Professor Alexander. So from our perspective, we adhere to the Sendai framework, the international protocols, and we are signatory as Canada to the Sendai framework that frames um, the disaster risk reduction global tenants. Uh, we want to be with all of you before a disaster happens. So you see our red vests, um, obviously when things are happening and unfolding in real time, but to take an oil and gas, uh, analogy here, we want to be more upstream to be to be prepared for disruptive events. Uh, we are all living in an era of climate change. We are looking at how do we collaborate and um, mobilize our assets to be more resilient, uh, well prepared. And uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Alexander is going to walk us through this. I'm going to read a quote from um, from our guest speaker to talk about disaster risk reduction. Typically planning for disaster is a conservative process. If it exists at all, its value is consistently underrated and its functions are consistently misunderstood. Governments tend to plan for past disasters, not future ones. We do not have the foresight to anticipate what comes next. What we lack is the leadership to do something about it. I say to leaders, it's absolutely necessary that you be radical. We need a revolution, not the usual pitiful, slow and feeble pace of evolution. Some of uh, the messages that we hope to hear today are emergency planning and management is a key profession uh, that we need in community and to develop it nationally. 
in the technological age move from command and control uh, perspectives to coordinate and collaborate. And this is what we'll be talking about over the next seven months and to modernize the, the culture of civil protection and make it more inclusive. So on behalf of the Red Cross, thank you for joining us. Uh, to Fuse Social, thank you for organizing and bringing people together. And if there was ever a time to be more resilient and prepared and lean into each other, I think 2021 may personify what we need to do for the future. Back to you guys. Awesome, thank you so much, Jen. And on that note, let's get to who we're really here to listen to today. I have the honor of introducing Professor David Alexander. Um, honestly, I'm going to let him introduce himself because all of his accolades, I want to make sure I don't mess any of them up. So off to you, Professor. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, uh, that's, that's a relief because I've had lots and lots of problems with that. But anyway, it's great to be talking to you. Um, last time I came to Canada was to commemorate 100 years since the uh, 1917 Halifax Harbour ship explosion. Uh, two things struck me there. One is that Canada virtually started disaster risk reduction and has been a bit of a leader ever since. And the other was what an amazingly friendly welcome I got when I came there. So uh, it's always great to liaise with Canadians, be with Canadians and, and uh, come to Canada when one can. Um, right, let's share my PowerPoint uh, in the hope that I can successfully do that. Uh, hopefully you can now uh, see this. You'll have to excuse me for calling this the social services sector. Social profit is not a word that we tend to use in Europe. But nevertheless, I hope that at least some of this will be of relevance to you and, and of interest to you and perhaps might even help a little uh, as you chart your way through these very, very difficult times that we are going through now, uh, where the challenges are enormous and we need to adapt, adapt, adapt. I'm just amazed as I look around the world and particularly as I look around the UK and Europe at how there is a frantic effort to plan for the last disaster and not for the next one. I find that really deeply depressing. Things are changing very substantially. I was struck over the summer how every time I turned on the television news, and I mean quite literally once a day, there were new news, there was new news about disasters, whether they be flash floods, tornadoes, landslides, storms, the odd earthquake here and there, but just about every single day, wildfires in particular, which you must know a great deal more than I do about, were very much near to the top of the list in that process. Let's get this moving. I'd like to start with a little bit of a theoretical basis of all of this. Uh, I hope this doesn't confuse the issue rather than clarifying it, but I've got lots of ideas about this that I'd like to share, because I think it really is time that we try to drag this whole field into the 21st century and look at how we're going to cope with what happens next. And I'm rather worried about that. Now, traditionally, we look at things like this. You've got a variety of different categories, hazard, exposure, vulnerability, resilience and so on. And we debate each of these and we debate each of the things that we have to do in this. But of course, what we actually have to do is dispense with this diagram and develop a more holistic approach because we cannot simply do a bit of ecological work, a bit of economic work, and then think it's all solved. Vulnerability by and large is the key to this, but we need to understand vulnerability rather well. Exactly what is it? Who does it apply to and how? And how does it manifest itself in disaster? Vulnerability is a bit like friction. It isn't there until you move something. In friction, you don't have it until you rub one body against another or whatever and then it mobilizes. Likewise, vulnerability, and that makes it a bit of a, an elusive concept, something that is a little bit difficult to get a handle on. We live in complicated times, and one reason we do is that we live in network societies with increasing and already very high dependency on technology. 
And if that technology fails, as it will, as it will, then we have problems, surely. But we also live in a time where things interact in all sorts of ways, and we need to try, we need to struggle to understand those adaptations, those interactions, and adapt to them. Now, I think we have to do this in a variety of ways. Firstly, with disaster, we've got to understand it quite deeply. We've got to understand what is behind it. We've got to understand not merely what triggers it when it happens, but why it should be triggered in the first place, how people are vulnerability, vulnerable to it, what sort of pressures start disaster off, what sort of pressures create the conditions under which disaster occurs. Now that also is pretty widely understood and accepted. I would go further though. I think that we need to understand the context in which it occurs. And I believe there are cases in which the context is actually more important than the disaster itself in explaining why things are. I woke up one night thinking, you can't make people resilient against floods if you can't make them resilient generally. Therefore, if they are not resilient generally, they're not resilient against floods. Hence, I propose a sort of fried egg model. The yolk of it, the yellow bit, is the disaster itself and all the things that contribute to it. But we can really only understand it if we understand the context in which it occurs, which will also define who is most likely to be affected or most profoundly affected by it. Here's a rather better diagram, a little bit less frivolous. But essentially, I think we have to understand general vulnerability and within that, specific vulnerability to wildfires or floods or whatever the hazard of the day is. By the way, we tend to have a bit of an ice cream parlor mentality when it comes to disaster. Flavor of the month. Uh, of course, this does vary from place to place, but of course, COVID has been flavor of the month, month after month after month. And yet now we're beginning to have other things. For example, in Greece yesterday, there was an earthquake. Well, that might be the flavor of the month in the, Medi in the Mediterranean. But of course, the trouble is we really have to get to grips with all of these things and we cannot afford to forget those that are not the flavor of the month. But neither can we afford to forget the conditions which make people generally vulnerable and therefore specifically vulnerable to different kinds of disaster. So we end up with situations where disaster occurs and who recovers and who recovers first and best? Well, a lot depends upon access to resources and that rather depends on the state of the economy and the nature of the economy. And really where you've got plenty of unemployment and where you've got plenty of poverty and so on, you're not gonna get a good recovery unless you can deal with those two uh, instances before and as well as dealing with the disaster. In times of austerity, in times of increasing equality, in times of marginalization, how are we going to get to groups with disaster? Inequality really started to take off over the period 1970 to 1973, but since then it has increased, increased and increased in the world. And that really is not a good thing. Firstly, societies by and large overall are happier and better off if there is less equality and if people are able to uh, join in with the fruits of, uh, of, uh, of success and productivity and so on. Uh, the more unequal a society is, the more it's likely to be seriously affected by disaster. So really we have to look at the allocation of resources in society, who gets what. I do believe in the world as a whole, we've seen over the last 50 years, a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. $10 trillion stashed away in 87 But anyway, if I start going on about that, I'll never stop we have an agenda to sticky gritty is that we're also into this very strange age much dominated by social media where we've got objective reality and perceived reality but what is reality now i was trained in science and in that you're trained to think there is only one objective reality and you're in pursuit of it 
But over the last 41 years of studying disaster, I've come to the conclusion that they are endless realities. And who is to say that my reality is any more real than anyone else's? And the trouble with that is that, as you see with COVID and uh, the no vaxxers and the deniers and the conspiracy theorists and all the rest of them, we're leading into a situation where we've really got to deal with rather than discounting those who have radically different views to our own. So in fact, although you might say, well, this is rubbish, this is nonsense what they're saying, in point of fact, it actually manufactures a sort of reality because it's something that has a being in its own right and something that we have to deal with rather than turning our back on it. And that is something that we've not been able to get to grips with well so far. I published a paper in 2014, which surveyed social media and disasters. There were seven different ways that social media are used and the prognosis then was pretty good. The verdict was that social media are really helpful. Now, if I were to rewrite that now, I haven't got time. If I had time, I'd do it, but I would be, much less optimistic. It will be a much darker future as a result of all sorts of interfering, meddling, and the rise of opinions and perceptions that really one wouldn't wish to subscribe to if one has enough knowledge. On the other hand, we also have to be humble about people's opinions and perceptions. They do matter and they do count. So the axiom there is you can't really understand disasters and therefore you can't solve the disasters problem unless you understand the context in which they occur. And I'll have more to say about that shortly. Another thing to bear in mind is that we're dealing with cascading disasters. By this, I mean cascading consequences. I don't mean the earthquake that causes the avalanche that causes the rockfall. That also is a form of cascade, but I'm much more concerned about mental health, about increases in poverty, about all the things that fit together when disaster occurs. And one reason why we have cascades is because increasingly we live in networked societies. We are dependent on technology and we interact in ways that are very much governed by technology. And one has to ask, well, what will happen when technology fails? The key to technology is electricity distribution. You know about what happens when that goes down from the 1999 ice storm in Eastern Canada and subsequent events that have been smaller but similar in, uh, in Canada as well as elsewhere. Uh, but cascading disasters can lead to escalation points and that really is a defining characteristic of them. In an escalation point, vulnerabilities fit together in some way, they interact. The result of that is that we end up with something potentially worse. Now, one of the mothers of disaster, well, COVID is now the mother of cascading disasters. Before that, it was the Japanese earthquake, tsunami and nuclear release. And of course, the tsunami was far more devastating than the earthquake was for Japan. But the longest lasting effects of that will be the nuclear release, which was the result of the vulnerability of the nuclear plant, not to the earthquake, but to the tsunami. And then we have the mental health problems, the suicide problems, the infrastructure problems, the housing problems, the school problems, the resettlement problems, the translocation of radioactive material problems associated with the nuclear release. And so you can see how that is an M5, magnitude 5, cascading disaster. So what we find then with cascading disasters is we really have to do with a whole host of different things that fit together in some rather complex way, in which the whole middle of the diagram might be rather more important than the beginning of it, the trigger uh, um, phenomenon that causes the first impact. So here's a sort of model of disasters where on the left hand side we've got the causes. Now we've got the immediate causes, which might be the earthquake that causes the landslide that causes the damage. But we really need to ask, well, why did we build houses in that place in the first instance? Uh, we need to look at the root causes of things. And then we need to look at the cascading effects at different levels. Now I applied this to an apartment building fire in London, a place called Grenfell Tower, 72 dead, 24 stories of towering inferno, 
the long-term causes and the root causes were entirely political. It was a political disaster. It was the devastation of the safety regulations that did it. But the cascading effects were local, national and international. You could connect it to events in Kazakhstan and uh, France and Australia and goodness knows where, Dubai. Uh, but you could also connect it to a whole host of instances, about 511 around the country, around the UK, where there were similar sorts of uh, risk from uh, uh, flammable tall residential buildings and subsequently several fires. So in fact, we can apply a model like this. But anyway, it really is time to look at social issues and welfare uh, as a prelude to looking at um, uh, voluntary associations and the third sector. Now, we live in a world in which many of the, the key points were established around 1628 and the Peace of Westphalia which sort of set in motion the process of building and consolidating the modern state with its boundaries, its sense of nationality and sovereignty and so on. And yet we also live in an increasingly globalized world and a world where perhaps a few years ago we passed the threshold where mobility is out of the bag. It's now an uncontrollable worldwide phenomenon. That's both legitimate mobility and mobility that certain people don't think is legitimate at all. So really all of these different things are contestable. Identity is one of them. Modern identity is only about 400 years old as such, but your identity connected to your nationality, connected to your ethnicity, connected to where you live, where you came from, where you were born, where your ancestors came from and all of that. Well, it's not all going to disappear, but it may undergo subtle modifications as we move into the present century and increasing turmoil on all fronts. But I want to focus on welfare, but what is it? Now, one of the curious things about welfare, at least in the context of disaster, is you never see it defined. So here in blue is the definition, it's my own. Why don't we see it defined? Well, politicians don't want to do it. They might have to stick to their own definition and they would be terrified of that. But essentially, welfare is about looking after those who cannot adequately look after themselves, where collectively we take on that burden in the interest of having a reasonable society that isn't unfair, unkind, and basically cruel. However, in welfare, we also need to focus on what it is not. In other words, where we might be actually wasting money. Now, that isn't a neoliberal uh, statement as such. It's merely an appeal to common sense that we spend our money on welfare wisely. By and large, I would say we need to spend more on welfare, not less. And it would probably be good for all of us if we did. But it does depend on how we spend it. Now, when it comes to disaster, we can look back at the sociologists, one of whom was uh, Alan Barton, who published a book that was very well received in, and, and translated into many languages called Communities in Disaster. And he wasn't exactly the inventor of the idea of the post-disaster therapeutic community, but he certainly looked into it, delved into it quite deeply and publicized the idea. It is almost associated with him. And the idea here is that after disaster, there is an accession of, of, uh, of, of public welfare, there is an accession of desire to participate, to help each other, to join in, to volunteer and all the rest of it. It may not last long. It may not be absolutely universal, but it certainly does occur. There is generally greater consensus about what needs to be done, what's good and what's bad, what's acceptable behavior and what isn't acceptable behavior and so on. So there is a post-disaster therapeutic community, even if you don't have to look hard to find exceptions to it. And then we have to think about disaster subcultures, which might be an outgrowth of the post-disaster sense of community. And these really, uh, uh, white uh, male, dead white males, but uh, uh, I trust that in future we'll have a better gender balance, if nothing else. Um, 
nevertheless, here are some of the protagonists of the idea of a disaster subculture where people who are actually very different from each other have a common objective. It might be an objective for greater safety or quicker recovery or greater equity in the process of recovery or something like that. But it will produce a disaster subculture of a very heterogeneous group of participants. And that will sit somewhere in the midst of this triangle between established organizations, those that emerge, uh, that, that, that are created out of the disaster and sheer spontaneous participation. So there are some stakeholders uh, one thing we need to ask ourselves, though, is what about community? What does it mean and how are subcultures related to that concept of community? If they occur, they occur surely within the compass of community. But what is community? It's actually a rather contentious thing. It doesn't have a scale. You could argue that we here today are a community, but I'm on the other side of the world. Fair enough. I have plenty of online communities and they tend to have no geographical boundaries at all in some cases. Moreover, where you've got a community, perhaps a local one, perhaps it's street level or neighborhood level or town level or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean that the community is harmonious or homogeneous. It might be very heterogeneous and it might be at odds with itself. It might be full of conflict. And do people identify with it? And that also is a highly varied phenomenon. Some people do, some people don't. Some people might identify with aspects of the community, but not other aspects. And then who runs the community? Is it democratic? Or are there in fact power structures? And, and, and do people agree with those power structures or conform to them? And in fact, in the community or outside it, are there marginalized elements are they communities in their own rights or, or part of the community? And of course, if they're marginalized, they lack control over their own affairs, socially, economically, and in, in other respects. So community is widely used and it's often regarded as a sort of saint that will solve our problems. Now, I'm very much in favor of dealing with disaster at the local level. There's really no other way to do it, no matter how large the disaster is. Even COVID, which is worldwide, is a local phenomenon that needs to be dealt with locally. So we might uh, take Yuri Brunfenbrenner's uh, model here of community at different scales, if we can actually do anything with this model uh, and, and op um, operationalize it in some manner uh, and, and think about it in, in those terms. But disaster risk reduction is not all hunky-dory. It's not all sweetness and light. We get elite capture. Now, of course, when you say that, many people think of uh, perhaps some village in Africa, in rural Africa. But in point of fact, I found elite capture in the Thames Basin of the London area of the United Kingdom. And in fact, it was elite captured by the extremely wealthy of an agenda that disadvantaged the middle class, because in that area, there were no working class at all. So elite capture can occur anywhere where the most powerful people in the community um, have the agenda. Power structures. And power, sadly, is seldom wielded benignly. And if it's absolute power in the world, in the words of uh, Harold Acton, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So it is very often true that corruption and human rights are strong determinants of disaster vulnerability. There is even some research by three different research groups that suggest that the main cause of earthquake disasters is corruption. It's not seismicity, it's not the shaking of the ground. It's corruption and its effect upon the building trade, upon inspection, upon respecting uh, the building laws and norms, uh, regulations, and so on, all the rest of it. Now, with all of this, you know, social media, corruption, human rights, bearing in mind, for example, that COVID has led to reduction in human rights, according to Amnesty International and others, in about 88 different countries, is worrying. What we could be moving towards and what we have to stop ourselves moving towards is what Emile Durkheim in his book on labor called Anomie, 
he didn't invent the term, but it's uh, uh, a means of talking about a form of nihilism where things are really out of control and where there is a substantial loss of trust in authority, where the pact between those who lead and govern us and we who elect them or who are under their control is simply broken. And then what happens? So that's what we have to worry about and what we have to try to avoid in various ways. Now let's start talking about the antidote to that, the civil protection system of voluntarism. Firstly, it's the system itself. Now, if it's a good system, it probably will be organized at the national level, harmonized at the regional, but largely present at the local level. If it isn't, then it simply takes too long. It is too difficult to get resources where they're needed in time because all needs are local, no matter how widespread they are. So really we need a capillary system where all parts of it are present. Currently, I'm in the middle of a battle with the UK government over this, because frankly, I think the UK system is just a collection of fragments in a bag. It isn't a system at all. And the result of that is potentially catastrophic. In other words, the problem, the, the disaster could be the system rather than the event. So this needs to be integral. It needs to be governed by at least one basic law. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, voice going there, um, a, a national basic law that would uh, explain the system, set it up and um, create the structure whereby it can be activated. And then we go into the system down to the local level. In that process over the years, I think the evolution can be defined by a gradual movement from old style civil defense to newer style civil protection. The words, the terms are not used very clearly around the world. They're often confused or they're not used at all. Perhaps you might have emergency preparedness instead of either of them. But anyway, if we define civil defense as the protection of non-combatants against armed aggression, and civil protection as all the rest, particularly protection against uh, floods or storms or fires or whatever, then perhaps we do have a process of evolution away from the militarization of all of this towards a more participatory process where it is people always doing things for us, but it's all of us being part of civil protection. Now, it's not that I'm opposed to the armed forces. They often do a marvelous job. However, they've got other things to do. And in fact, we need to take up the burden at the local, regional and national level to ensure that we've got a viable, adequate, healthy civil protection system that also involves the population because the challenge of the 21st century is to get all of us involved in this. The risks are too large for single organizations or single governments to deal with alone. Now, one of the problems with this is we talk a great deal about how we need to transfer from responding to emergency to mitigating and preventing. Well, all right, so we do. But looking at what is happening now and the trajectory, the way it's going, I would say that actually, we're really going to have to beef up emergency response by an order of magnitude. I think you've seen that in Fort McMurray. But, you know, when every evening I turn on the television and I see films with pictures like this, and they're, they're fresh and new, then it's telling me the message there is that it's going to be worse in the future. And it's going to require not merely that we try and save people from this with search, rescue, medical care and all the rest of it, but that there will be an enormous role in damage limitation and it will require that we get together, not merely at the national level, but at the supranational level. So emergency response will involve a variety of it already. Uh, we need evacuation, search, rescue, medical care, and all the rest of it, disease prevention, et cetera. But we also need to be able to get infrastructure up and running again to reduce impact, uh, to cordon off or brace damaged structures and so on, 
and restore some kind of functionality to affected areas. Uh, and that will be quite a challenge with the disasters of the future. And there are clearly moments when we need extra capacity. So that leads us to voluntarism. And I think that we're out of the age of spontaneous voluntarism. It does help sometimes. It helps clean up the streets and things like that. It helps get people together. It helps people think they're doing something and so on. But essentially we need voluntarism that is organized and incorporated into the civil protection system. Now I'm a binational Italian and British. I spend at least half of my life at my home in Italy, in a town that has had a volunteer organization for 497 years, and it's now a very efficient, very modern ambulance service. But it's also uh, got other volunteer organizations, and in Italy there are 3,600 volunteer organizations that work in the civil protection field. The point is not merely that, though. The point is that they have legal statutes and protection and they are part, they are in fact the backbone of the emergency response system. So they're heavily engaged. And that is one way by which the public are connected with the system because the public are the volunteers, or if they're not, they're the sons, daughters, sisters, fathers, and so on of the volunteers. So volunteerism needs to be tuned. It needs to be beefed up in an age in which, in fact, it has um, had a rather variable history. Um, people have moved away from voluntarism because of the dictates of their work and the difficulties associated with finding and keeping employment and maintaining an adequate standard of living. In other words, they have less leisure time, less leisure that they can actually devote to voluntarism, and it has proved something of a problem, especially in countries that are heavily dependent on it, for example, Australia, or indeed Italy or Germany, and so on. But nevertheless, voluntarism is not going to go away. Um, in Italy, it has a 778-year history, uh, unbroken, and therefore it has that momentum. In Germany, there are more than a million civil protection volunteers, 630 bases to THW, the main uh, um, organization that they work in. But we need to tune that up in the ways that the diagram perhaps suggests so that we can ensure uh, that the volunteerism is able to do the tasks and up to the challenges that are likely to occur. Training, education are important in that as they are for full-time salaried employees. But with all of this, what we have to do is to get out of disciplinary viewpoints and establish our common objectives so that we can create and utilize a common language and a common culture of civil protection where we're all working towards common aims because we're all participating in the plans. Nested plans, hierarchical, national to local, plans for specific things like airports and hospitals and so on. And, and, uh, and all of that uh, has to be backed by this common culture <clears throat> where we understand each other and where, in fact, we're able to have a dialogue with specialists in about 42 different disciplines and professions. So culture is a very difficult thing to deal with generally. It's multifaceted, very much so. But what we have to add to it is the civil protection culture we have to overlay that on whatever culture is dominant in a person's life, uh, uh, whichever facet of culture uh, they prefer, then we have to overlay the civil protection culture. And in many respects, it is the opposite of the consumer culture because it's a giving culture rather than a taking culture. How to do that? Well, it does require mass education. It requires public debate. It requires substantial time in the mass media. It requires campaigns. It requires a presence on social networking. Let me, let me stop and, and just mention one case. It was a place called Al Quarta del Tronto, which in uh, 2016 was devastated by earthquake. 
uh, with a significant number of deaths, but nevertheless a population totally displaced from the town. And in it, a group of 17 year olds set up a Facebook site. Uh, it was called Ask the Dust. Uh, and it became famous. It got 10,000 uh, likes. Uh, it was featured on the BBC. Uh, and they, in fact, were perhaps the main source of information because they were relaying official information through their website. And they're all, as young people, tend to be geniuses with the, the technology. Uh, and it was a heartening example of how, rather than just sitting around, they were doing something for the community. That perhaps is a good example of spontaneous volunteerism. Uh, before we go any further, I think we really have to um, tackle the elephant in the room, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, which really has been an incredible learning opportunity. And uh, for me, after 41 years of studying disasters, it's rather like seeing my entire career flash past my eyes at high speed. But what lessons can we derive? Well, there are very many of them. And on my department's uh, website, I put a, a document, uh, which is about 50 pages of lessons for emergency planning, which I put together through running a sort of COVID observatory. One thing that is very clear that you can in fact look at and see in different countries is that decision-making needs to be clear, consistent, transparent, and especially in the way it is communicated. Dithering in communication, being opaque and unclear just isn't on. It destroys trust in authority. It means that people will not do as they're told and it creates endless problems and confusion. It is very difficult in a dynamic changing situation such as COVID, well, actually all disasters, wildfires, floods, they're dynamic and changing too. But nevertheless, it is very difficult to maintain a line when you know that next week, next week you might have to make a fairly radical change towards a new direction that better fits the circumstances and, of course, the need to keep people safe. But nevertheless, it is the way that it is done that matters most in this. We really have to do it in such a way as to maintain the trust, increase the trust in authority. Uh, I don't think that's been well done in the UK. It's been a lot better done in Italy, where, in fact, two prime ministers have been pretty upfront about what's gone wrong, what's gone right, mistakes made by government, things done well by government. And by and large, that has led to an increase in the level of trust, being honest about it. Another factor about COVID is that it's been treated generally as a medical problem. Well, I'm not trying to suggest it isn't a medical problem and an epidemiological one, but only half of it is. The rest of it is a standard civil protection problem, how to get things where they need to be. About 70% of disaster management is geography. Uh, and about half of COVID management is disaster management. It's a question of procurement, logistics, mass communication, and all the things that need to be done that are actually are not medical at all. Planning, not merely having a plan in the first place, and there's been, there have been huge recriminations about that, but planning that goes on during the event in a reasonable, acceptable sort of way. Uh, where we tailor the plans that we have to the circumstances that change. And of course, involvement in that process of the third sector, volunteers, the local level, and all the rest that need to be properly involved in it. Another great lesson of COVID, very easy to ignore, marginalise or leave out certain communities or certain sectors of the population. Inclusiveness is important. Intersectionality here has two meanings. One is the meaning about how people define themselves in terms of gender, ethnicity, uh, social grouping, uh, community grouping, and so on. And we have to accept a degree of complexity in that and deal with it. The other is intersectionality, 
between something like COVID and other forms of disaster. Now, most disasters require, COVID is supposed to require physical distancing. So how do we deal with those earthquakes and fires and floods and so on during the height of a major pandemic? Very difficult. We need to devote more thought to that process. We have also found in a variety of countries, perhaps worldwide, that the elderly care sector is extremely vulnerable and has often been neglected in this process, leading to higher rates of mortality. Now, it does depend on what sort of disease you've got in as much as the influenza epidemic of 1918 to 1920 predominantly struck young, healthy adults. But most other viral infections are more likely to wreak havoc among the elderly. And this is why elderly care needs to be in the front line of the emergency plan. Another thing that I have noted is that poorer communities are very, very sensitive to the effects of political decisions. Now, the effects of political decisions might give money to the unemployed or the homeless or whatever, or take it away. <coughs> there might be um, austerity or there might be generosity, largesse in this. But whatever the decisions when they're made and the changes that occur, they tend to rebound first and foremost most profoundly and most quickly on poorer communities that really blow in the wind with government decision making and the politics of the disaster. That perhaps is where welfare needs to be at its most robust. <coughs> Conclusions. Right. Sorry. The challenge of the century <clears throat> is to involve ordinary people <clears throat> in decision making, in understanding disaster, in having their say, and in participating in the process of dealing with it in whatever way they are capable of and think is appropriate. It was encouraging to see in Japan, which I've been frequenting quite a bit over the last 10 years, how since the tsunami of 2011, there has been quite a radical increase in the most affected communities in the degree of public participation, plus a rather belated realization in Japanese government that they do have to increase this rather. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done there, but at least it is an encouraging sign. In this whole process, in disaster, we need realism uh, rather than faking it. And we need flexibility that will enable us to adapt to all sorts of things that are going to happen. Emergency response, let alone the um, mitigation, prevention, preparedness, emergency response in its own right will probably need to be about an order of magnitude larger than it is now. Look at all the things that can happen. They don't inevitably spell do doom and and, 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 and catastrophe. What they intend, what they instead tend to spell is that we simply need to be more ready on a bigger scale. There needs to be more interaction, there needs to be more participation, both in a place and over wider geographical areas. We're dealing with intensified meteorological hazards, as we all know, and we've seen this summer and in previous years, the effects of that. And we've seen that what was presumed to be the uncommon disaster isn't anymore. And then we've got the unusual hazards. I don't think we can call them black swans. I don't believe there are black swans. In fact, I think the black swan is extinct. And I think its ecological niche has been occupied by the red herring. But anyway, space weather is a well-known phenomenon, coronal mass ejections of the sun, and they could knock out your electricity supply and moreover do damage that might take weeks, months, or even years to put right. So what would you do without electricity? Technological failure in general has to be dealt with. In other words, what are the alternatives? Now much of course depends on people's expectations. In 1945, if you didn't have chickens, you didn't get eggs. Uh, but expectations were quite low at the time where people will accept 
various things that now they absolutely wouldn't uh, accept at all. In fact, they go straight to their lawyers. But nevertheless, technological failure, I fear, is inevitable in some form. What we have to do is not merely limit it by preparedness, but also deal with it when it occurs, anticipate it. And likewise, with forms of migration and disruption, we have to be ready for those as well. Less improvisation, more pre-planned activity. Emerging risks and pandemics, this is not the last pandemic. Influenza has about a 35 to 40 year cycle, although it is highly irregular. It might be great, it might be large, or it might be small. Who knows? So, resilience as against vulnerability. We need both the emergency response and the beneficiaries of it to be resilient, both counts. In that disaster risk reduction, we cannot do it without the third sector. We just simply cannot, it's too big a task. But then we have to integrate that. In other words, make it part of the system by integrating it with the general sustainability agenda at the community, the city, the state or province level, the national level, whatever. All those levels. So sustainable disaster risk reduction and sustainable disaster response, and it needs to be part of that general sustainability agenda and not underrated. The trouble with that is we live in interesting times where we have to deal with all of these things. The causes of many disasters are political and social, and that needs to be borne in mind. The politics needs to be brought around to be able to focus on the solutions, the durable, sustainable solutions to this. And I'm talking like a politician, aren't I? I've got to stop it. But anyway, with all of these, these, these challenges are going to interact and intersect. And that is what we need to think about. Don't be afraid of complexity, but do face up to it. So physical, economic, social, psychological, we've seen it in COVID, not much physical damage, perhaps not at all. But nevertheless, that is only one thing that makes it a rather distinctive disaster. All of these things require recovery and recovery has to be guided, supported, resourced whatever. So I think we can prepare for the future, but we need foresight and we need to get out of the trap of preparing for previous events and assuming that the past is the key to the future to an extent it always will be. But to a greater extent, things are changing just too fast at the moment. We can get things and that would be a lot better than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, uh, which is the famous old metaphor. And I believe that's an actual picture of it happening on the Titanic. Goodness knows how it survived the sinking. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to respond to them. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Was there any questions that anyone had? Like I had said before, you can just go ahead and leave them in the chat or the question and answer function. Oh, or email me afterwards. I see a hand raised. Ah, so I have one question here. So as you mentioned early on in the lecture, can you please explain Canada's role in establishing the disaster risk reduction movement prior to right. the Sendai framework. Yeah, right. sure. Um, yeah. It was towards the end of the First World War. A munitions ship from France was sailing up Halifax Sound and it crashed into a refugee ship from Norway, caught fire. It had barrels of fuel on the deck, the munitions had the ground. People from Halifax flocked to see the fire. 20 minutes later, it exploded, devastating Halifax, killing. 1,950 people seriously injuring 9,000. In one of the houses of Halifax, an Anglican curate 
called Samuel Henry Prince was having breakfast. Now he was behind a brick wall and when the house was blown to bits, he survived quite well immediately and carried on doing so for several years. And in that process wrote a lot of notes, which he very rapidly transformed into a um, PhD thesis at Columbia University, which was immediately published in 1920, um, Disasters and Social Change. And uh, you can download a PDF of it if you can find it on the uh, internet and, and just look for Samuel Henry Prince. Um, I actually found a biography of him uh, by his bishop um, in a bookshop in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Sammy the Prince, he was known as, uh, and he really was at least one of the people, if not the person who started off the idea of the social interpretation of disaster. Others came afterwards, but Canada has always produced extraordinary people. One of those was the late Joe Scanlon, who was professor of journalism at Carleton University and studied disasters for 43 years uh, before dying at a fairly old age. Uh, Joe was an absolutely wonderful person, and uh, he, he had a really superb understanding of disaster and was much respected for it. The Canadian Risks and Hazards Network is also extremely lively, I think, and uh, it's always great to participate in it. So I would say that uh, Canada, for its population size, punches above its weight in this field and has pretty much always done so. Uh, there are, of course, lots of other developments um, that, that Canadians have, have produced of, of various kinds. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Jen, did you have a question or a comment? First, I have an apology for Professor Alexander. I am actually going to give a quick bio of your accomplishments as an academic and a leader. Please, yes, yes. And then I have a question about psychosocial support. So uh, the gentleman that we just heard in Wisdom and Experience is a professor of risk, risk and disaster reduction at the University College of London, graduated in geography from the London School of Economics and obtained his PhD in Mediterranean geomorphology from UCL. From 1982 to 2002, um, David taught uh, Geomorphology, Physical Geography, National hazard, or Natural Hazards and Disaster Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, then moved on to uh, 2003 to 2007, Scientific Director at the Advanced School of Civil Protection of the Regional Government of Lombardy. And then just to keep on going in a fantastic trajectory, uh, professor, the professor then moved on to the University of Florence from 2005 to 2011, where you were a leader uh, in the membership of a team that, that designed, launched, and taught Italy's first Master of Civil Protection course, which is outstanding. And uh, my, I was deeply remiss, I was remiss to not mention this before you spoke, uh, Professor Alexander. So thank you for all of your, your academic work and your liaising. My question for you is, from your perspective uh, and your lens, um, have we become collectively numb to disruptive events and disasters and the psychosocial impact of our own resiliency in collaborating for readiness. Do you have any thoughts that you can share with us on that perspective? Yeah, um, I don't think we've become collectively numb to it because when it affects us, we tend to get very upset about it. Um, the question then would be, have we become collectively numb to helping others? I think volunteerism is still very much alive and I think it will remain very much alive. Um, the Queen in the UK once said in one of her Christmas messages, which usually don't contain anything of interest, but uh, what she did say this time was that of all the people she had met, those who helped others seemed to be the happiest, the most contented and the most fulfilled. Uh, and that perhaps is one of the the things about volunteerism, people become volunteers for various reasons, as you probably know better than I do. Um, 
they, they might want some company, they might want something to do, uh, they might want to be part of a bigger sort of family, um, or they might have altruistic motives about helping others or, or some combination of this, or they might just simply want to do something interesting. Uh, but I think they end up having some fulfillment out of good works that are done. Uh, so I don't think that the voluntary sector is going to go away, but I think the tragedy comes where it's not properly utilized because the system does not accept it. Um, at the moment in the UK, the um, leaders of voluntary organizations that do participate in emergencies are complaining that it's not joined up. They're not part of the system. They don't have an official role and so on. Well, they should have. They are so vital and so needed. Uh, when I compare that with somewhere like Italy, with its 3,600 voluntary organizations, 36 federated nationally, it means that any reasonable size town, and by reasonable size, I mean more than about seven or 8,000 inhabitants, has got its volunteer base. It's in charge of training for the region of Lombardy, which is a pretty large region by European standards, 1,547 municipalities, 12 provinces. We did a survey and we came up with 960 training courses that were being held. Uh, so we started applying, uh, developing a standard and, and applying it to the courses so we could verify that there were actually any use. And that was all part of a process of trying to increase the degree of cohesion in the sector. Uh, so I think it does need that cohesion. It needs to be able to have that nine o'clock in the morning meeting where you say, right, your organisation does this, your organisation does that, you go here, they go there. Uh, so that we've got this, this um, unified um, approach attack on the event as it unfolds. In Florence, um, I live in the province of Florence when I'm in it, I'm in London at the moment, but um, I've just spent the last 18 months in the province of Florence working from home. And in the city of Florence, it's had civil protection voluntaries and since 1244, when a group of mates in a pub were swearing so much, they said, every time we swear, we'll put a groat, you know, a coin in a slot. At the end of it, we'll break the jar and we'll have a big feast. There was so much money in there, they were too embarrassed to have a meal on the basis. And they instead devoted it to founding a sort of charitable association, which is still going. And it's still in the same building as it was in in 1244. Uh, but nowadays, it's a pretty modern affair that does an awful lot of different medical work and um, has a really efficient ambulance service. It didn't arrive in my adopted hometown until 1525, but it's been there ever since. You see the people in their blue and yellow uniforms and, you know, you relate to them. Uh, local people are proud of this. Uh, they support it, not merely because they think one day I might need an ambulance, but also because they're proud that it's, it's theirs, it belongs to them, and so on. And in Florence, there's a consortium of 29 voluntary organisations that if the alarm goes and there's a need for a big response, they can put 10,000 operatives into the field in 10 minutes and 5,000 in, sorry, 1,000 in 10 minutes and 5,000 in two hours, and then uh, go on the up from there. And the regional plan, along with the other 19 regions of the country, can put together a convoy of relief, goods, materials, vehicles, and personnel in a matter of hours and set it off towards a disaster zone. Uh, and that is simply the result of a slow, patient building up of a system that consists of the National Emergency Operations Centre government and all the rest of it, and the various departments. Uh, and in fact, civil protection is part of, or dependent upon the cabinet, not individual ministries, uh, which is a, a European non-binding directive that Italy fostered. Uh, and, and then the, the readiness down that capillary system through the uh, regions, the provinces, the big municipalities and the small ones, and it fits together. It has to, because when you've got big disasters, you need all of that. 
The net outcome of that has been that in the last four major earthquakes, there have been more emergency responders than population. For example, in the L'Aquila earthquake of 2011, population of the city of L'Aquila, 68,200, number of volunteers in the field, 94,000. For three months, three quarters of the vehicles on the road were emergency vehicles. In the Matrice um, earthquake of 2016, affected population, 4,000, number of volunteers at work, 7,500 saturation of course it won't happen in a really really big disaster but at least it's better than being unprepared having a fragmentary system and so on and it is an indication an illustration of how we just got to get this moving to a bigger scale simply because of what is likely to happen in the future thank you that's fascinating and a shout out to our red cross peers in italy <laughs> They do a great job. Well, they do in most countries, perhaps all countries. Wonderful. All right. I have received a, a question directly that I'll just read out to you here. So mm -hmm. a great obstacle for the social sector is having funders, with the exception of the Red Cross, not just responding to disasters, but allowing us to be innovative in the disaster risk reduction space. Do you advise on or have an example of an area who does this well? Um, Sweden does it well, although I'm not entirely sure why, because I've been concentrating on the official sector rather than the voluntary sector in studying Sweden. I just have this sensation it does it well. But one reason why is that Swedish culture is very collectively orientated. Um, and, and there is a, a huge sense of social responsibility in Scandinavian countries. Uh, in the Italian case, government has passed a law years and years ago that obliges banks to devote 10% of their profits to good causes. Uh, as most banks have a local base, uh, they tend to do it locally. The first thing they do with their, what you might call their excess profits is to buy ambulances, which they then give to volunteer ambulance services. Um, also, um, where you've got incorporated voluntary organizations you may find or you hopefully you would find that government funds them not in the sense of paying salaries to their volunteers but perhaps in the sense of funding some training and funding the purchase of equipment vehicles and clothing and things like that uh, one one hopes so I mean, it doesn't automatically happen but when it really is a system of hope that that is what could be done. Other than that, it's a case of really going around with cap in hand. Um, but somehow we have to convince people that this is worth pursuing. They do when it comes to some big event that stirs them emotionally. The question is, how can we make sure they do in ordinary times? In the town I live in in Italy, an ambulance caught fire. It burnt to a cinder. It was a short circuit, I think, in it. It was nothing, uh, it wasn't vandalism or anything. And so everyone in the town got a duplicated letter saying, we need a new ambulance, could you make a donation? And everyone marched down to the ambulance base and opened their wallets. And six weeks later, two state-of-the-art arrest ambulances were parked out. It's not merely you think one day I might need this, but also the pride that people have and the sense of ownership of it. So a lot has to do with the connection between the system and the people. If they feel remote from it, then they, they're not likely to participate. This has been something of a problem in Japan, where volunteerism has been fairly slow to develop and is still rather restricted in the civil protection field. Also, it has to do with uh, Japan's post-war non-militarism, and that perhaps is changing. Uh, but volunteerism is growing in Japan in civil protection uh, as well it might. But the trouble with Japan is that decisions are generally made by elderly men in Tokyo. This has been a horrible problem for the gender issue, but it's also been a problem for people feeling somewhat alienated from decisions made about their own environment and their own lives. 
so democracy is actually terribly important, but perhaps more participatory democracy than representative democracy. Wonderful, thank you. All right, we'll move to, I have a few questions on here from the question and answer tab. So um, it says, thank you so much for speaking with us. Putting on your future goggles, how do you think COVID-19 will shift our approach to disasters? Do you think there will be long-term changes? Gosh, I wish I could answer that with confidence. I certainly hope there will be long-term positive changes. Uh, I think that those of us who've been studying it have been trying to push for good changes, trying to push that process along. Uh, whether inertia will get the better of us, inertia in government and in government decision making, I don't quite know. It rather depends on the, the character of governments, not necessarily whether they're left or right, although that might have a factor. It depends on what you might think about it. But um, governments are very obsessed by certain priorities at certain times. The trouble is that this is not going to go away. Um, I think what the governments have to get to grips with is that we're going to have more and more disasters more and more often. Therefore, you have to be more and more uh, prepared for it. For example, in, in Europe, we have the civil protection mechanism, which means that countries can ask each other through this mechanism, can you lend me some resources? A Canada aircraft, which will bomb uh, with flame retardant, a wildfire or something like that? The answer might well be no, or it might be yes, of course they have to pay for it. But actually, it's a rather feeble and pathetic mechanism when you think about it. I think we're getting to the point where we've got to go for a sort of civilian army, uh, which will cross national borders just like that in order to beat out the flames or pump out the water or whatever is going on or at least some rethink of the whole problem. Um, and once again, that needs public support because all of this is going to cost resources. So much is dependent. The, the thing that flutters in the wind is the extent of public support during times of relative quiescence. So in the future, if we don't get long periods where not much is happening, then we might find the pressure is on, the heat is turned up in more ways than one, um, and something is done. And there is public demand for better civil protection, more change. But if we get a long period of relative quiescence where disasters are not so bad and not much is happening, then I worry about whether that in fact will lead to a tail off uh, that will then end in some cataclysmic event. Not a very good answer that. <laughs> I don't know how you can answer that the way everything's going right now. <laughs> well, we tried, you know, we're really interested in the answer to that question. It's a very, very important question, but. So what's next? All right, the next question. I am wondering on your thoughts on the effects of disasters on people's mental health and wellness. I think I am hearing you say volunteerism could help build mental health and psychosocial resilience and improve long-term mental health outcomes. Has there been any research to look into this? Um, the, the, the psychosocial research has mostly been on the effect of disasters on the volunteers themselves. Uh, do they suffer from post-traumatic stress and so on, or the effect upon the people that they help? Um, so there is scope for more in that respect. Uh, does volunteerism really and generally in this field make people happier? Well, I think it does, although uh, I think I have to search quite hard for rigorous research that, that proves it because it's a rather difficult proposition to prove in that respect. Um, but nevertheless, people keep volunteering. Um, People have a, an innate desire and need to do this. People, you know, humanity is composed of social animals. Um, and this is, is somewhat counterculture with respect to the individualism and consumerism. 
but not everybody accepts everything about individualism and consumerism. Not everyone wants to be a celebrity. And so on. some people are perfectly content to be there in the kitchen doing the cooking uh, for people who can't cook for themselves or, or whatever is needed or ferrying around people with disabilities or whatever uh, and find that uh, a worthwhile thing as indeed it very much is. So um, the question is how to capitalise and get what they need. So I think if it's part of the system, then perhaps we can call upon government or indeed expect government to sustain and support the voluntary sector as much as it needs to be. After all, this is not a matter about uh, giving someone who doesn't deserve them profits. The only profit of this, in this is the sense of satisfaction and, of course, the good work done. Uh, but then quite a bit depends on the extent to which a government believes in the concept of welfare. Some governments believe welfare is debilitating, but that really is of no help to someone who simply cannot improve their own circumstances, as many people with disabilities can't, and they often get left behind. Um, this is something that is improving slowly worldwide, but absolutely not fast enough, bearing in mind that, roughly speaking, worldwide in each country, one in seven people has a disability. People with disabilities, there's no uh, other way of describing them. Uh, one in seven in society, which is a huge minority. Uh, and it is not fair or reasonable that they be disadvantaged by circumstances. So therefore, what are we going to do to ensure that the playing field is more level? and that where they can participate, they do, that they, they don't have the trouble of being un unable to get through the front door or having their concerns or their needs roundly ignored. That is a solvable problem. We have guidelines, we have ways of dealing with it. It requires a fair degree of participation. Most emergency planning is done for people who do not have disabilities as groups. We plan for groups and communities. People with disabilities have to be planned for as individuals. Now, you might be able to class them together. Those who are in wheelchairs, those who have cognitive disabilities, so on and so forth. But they are not uniform and they require individual planning. And yet it can be done. You get the voluntary organisations, social services, health services, civil protection services around the table, and you can do it. It can be done. It's not only not impossible, it's eminently possible in all circumstances. Uh, much of emergency planning is also simply rearranging resources. That's to say, doing the best you can with the resources you've got. Uh, so anyway, I've got on a soapbox about that, but um, that's just one example of where a difference can be made. And of course, the people with disabilities, where they are articulate, need to be listened to. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, in the interest of time here, we'll have one final question so that we can end on time. So the last question I have for you here is, what are some effective ways you can share that have been used to build resilience in individuals and communities related to disaster risk reduction? Right. Um, really you need about three volumes uh, or maybe 10 volumes to be able to answer that. There are so many different ways and it is so dependent on different circumstances. But firstly, I think you need decent observation of human rights, quite apart from restrictions caused uh, to, to people's activities or cultures or whatever by lack of human rights. It's the lack of access to the information they need, which is the very first thing. Information is the first primary resource in disasters. And restriction of human rights curtails people's um, access to information. OK, so if we have a situation with fairly decent human rights, what we then need to do is democratise the process of civil protection. By and large, people don't want to be bothered with this and neither do governments. It's nasty. It's all about disasters, which are not positive things. Uh, OK, but there and again, it's actually sensible to think, well, what might happen here? We live in a town that's got a river running through it. Therefore, floods are possible. What are we going to do about it? 
and it's in people's personal interest to get together and share the approach to this and also participate in the decisions made about it and be informed about it as well. There will be those who lead and those who follow and those who don't care and those who do care. But nevertheless, it is possible to start to create the culture of civil protection among people. All of this is entirely dependent on individuals as human beings interacting with each other in some way, whether they be civic leaders, uh, politicians, ordinary people, bus drivers, or whatever they be, they still have to interact and participate. And if enough of them do that, then we might start to get somewhere in places that have intractable problems. Clearly, we've got to reduce the risk, but we've also got to make people aware of the risk and start getting people to have an objective, a more objective view of the risk. One of the things about COVID is that people just can't cope with understanding and managing the risk of it. Uh, they, they simply do not understand it. It is explained to them in conflicting ways. It is explained to them in overcomplicated ways. And it is explained to them in situations where there is a lack of trust between the explainer and the recipient of the information. Hardly surprising, therefore, that uh, they will do things which are unwise. For example, not get vaccinated and then die of COVID because they weren't vaccinated and things like that. So um, that, of course, is a huge problem uh, to face and to solve, but it is not an intractable problem. It just requires the right kind of approach and a sustained approach where we keep at it regardless of the successes and failures. We just keep doing it and we do have to keep doing it. A very good answer again, but uh, there again, these are just such huge problems. And there are places where, where people have done that, um, where, um, for example, the river floods, and they, they therefore just out of the area likely to be flooded, they put up a garden shed and filled it full of shovels and things like that. Uh, they got onto the local council and said, clean out that bridge. And, and if you can get some money and make the bridge wider, so that the water goes through it. Uh, and, and they went around to people and said, did you know that your house is floodable? Uh, and all of these things, they're all very simple things, but in the end, they were the beginnings of a big process. I worked with a, a community in Mexico where they had a huge landslide in 1999 that killed 130 people. They had absolutely no civil protection at all. The federal army came in, did a few things and disappeared. So since then, the town council debated, decided we've got to get this going. They appointed someone as the civil protection czar. He did nothing except take the money, thoroughly corrupt. Eventually, it took four years to get rid of him and then they began to take off. They had one ambulance, one fire engine and three people, one to drive the ambulance, one to drive the fire engine and one to answer the phone. And then they managed to get more people. They agitated for a bigger budget. They got more. Now they've got a service. 50 people got together and said, let's start a volunteer organization. They did that. They became part of the system. They're recognized as an organization. What they now need is equipment and training. But OK, they got onto the state level. It was a state of Puebla. Uh, in South Central Mexico. They got onto the state level. The state level now recognizes the volunteers as well as the municipal civil protection. So, you know, gradually it grows and it improves. And of course, if you get a disaster, it'll probably be a step change to improvement in civil protection afterwards because it will have yet more public support behind it. But people realize that this is important, useful, valuable, and necessary. Wonderful. Well, I will take this time to say thank you so much for speaking with us today, especially you're across the world right now, completely different time of day, completely different day. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Right at half past five in the afternoon, I salute you and I thank you. And uh, I wish you to have a, a very pleasant day and a productive time and stay safe. Yes. And uh, uh, I trust that uh, things will be on the up and improve in the civil protection field. Agreed. That's all we can do is just try and be optimistic. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to coming back to Canada whenever I can. You are always welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much.
And for Thank everyone you. else uh, participating here today, I just want to give you a little reminder. Um, our next session is coming up October 13th. Um, so that session, again, same time. So it will be at 9 to um, 1030. That session is understanding hazards and risks in order to remain operational and build resilience. So that will be featuring um, Dr. Jerolman. She actually worked um, with uh, nonprofits during uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. So that will be a very interesting uh, and very relevant uh, for our sector here and where we are dealing with natural disasters. Um, so that make sure you don't miss that one. If you haven't already registered, um, you can register on our website um, at www.fusesocial.ca. Um, if you have any further questions for um, Professor David Alexander, please feel free to email myself or his email directly. He did have it on his presentation there. Um, but again, if you need anything, just feel free to email me. Uh, that's all we have for you today. I hope you learned something about disaster risk reduction. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks.